we're here at the Fowler Center for Outdoor Learning and we're excavating a mastodon. It was found actually in 2014 by one of the teachers who works here and his class of high school students who were taking a nature walk. How many times does your nature walk deliver a mastodon skeleton? Well, they found a femur, a tibia, some ribs, and a few other bones of this animal that had washed out of the bank just across from us. And here, a little more than two years later, we finally arranged to come back and excavate the remains of that mastodon, those of them that still lie in the sediment undisturbed. Our job for today has been to expose as many of the bones as we can find as completely as we can. And we're now at the point of mapping them in the bank where they lay, where they've lain for more than 10,000 years, so that we can document that arrangement and use it as evidence of what might have happened to this animal after its death. We think we're seeing evidence of human activity human butchering procedures and meat storage procedures. Our idea is that humans brought carcass pot parts to a pond, submerged them, and were then able to store the meat for later use. But the evidence for that is, in a sense, coded in the placement of bones and their condition and their relationships to one another. And so those things are the things we're trying to resolve as we do this mapping and 3D documentation. We've been very fortunate here to have a drone overflight as part of our site work. And the, the images from that drone overflight are going to be used to construct a 3D model of all of those bones in place in the bank. And um, uh, that will take time. The rest of the work here will take time but uh, we've had a very, very good day, and so we're pleased as can be to be at this point. One question people often have is how did humans acquire carcasses like this? How did they, they get at this meat? Of course, there may have been circumstances. We have a few examples where we think animals died of causes independent of human activity, we'll say natural causes, and in those cases, humans they didn't care, the, you know, meat was meat, food was food, and they were able to come in and process a carcass of an animal that had died of natural carcasses. We speak of that as human scavenging of a natural death. So we do have examples of that, but not so many as it turns out. Most of the mastodons for which we have good evidence of carcass processing turn out to have died at a time of year that is actually not a common time for animals to die of natural causes. That's in the autumn. Autumn in general is a good time for these animals. They've had a whole summer to feed up and get fat and healthy. They're going into winter. They had better be in good shape for that winter. And they don't tend, there aren't many accidental causes of death that strike in the autumn. So it's kind of unusual to find natural deaths in the autumn, and we find very few of them. The only autumn deaths that we have are animals that show signs of carcass processing and butchery. And that is not absolutely definitive evidence, but probabilistic evidence that those animals are actually hunted and killed by human activity. So hunting was probably how humans often got these animals. How did they hunt? We know they have spears, we know they have spear throwers, which is a way of greatly magnifying the force of a thrown spear, the energy with which it strikes its target. And it's been demonstrated that the kinds of spears that we know they had are definitely lethal to animals of this size. So we don't have the details in most cases, but we know that it was feasible for humans to do. Something that I thought looked like a shoulder blade here is turning into a full-fledged shoulder blade. And what I was just in the process of saying to myself is, oh look, the metachromium process is broken. Metachromium process is a little projection from a part of the shoulder blade where muscles attach. And even though it's a slender part of the bone, it's quite sturdy because muscles do attach there and they pull hard, so it tends to be a pretty tough part of the skeleton. 
and yet at butcher sites where there's been carcass processing, we consistently find this projection broken off. And the reason for that is that was a very handy way, a simple way, to harvest the massive meat that was represented by those muscles that attach at just that point on that bone. And I see that that's broken off here, which for me is tick one, point one, in favor of this being a butchered animal, because it's again repeating patterns that we've seen at other sites. The bones that we've seen here are clearly those of a male mastodon. And we know that because we've measured them, we've identified them, and we see that they're larger than the bones of even a fully grown female. So we know that males were about, got to be about 25% larger than females in this particular species. And so the size alone suffices to argue that we're dealing with a male. The age of the animal is probably, in terms of its own individual age, it's probably something in its mid 30s. And we're judging that at the moment by the, the stage of development of some of the bones. Bones have a particular schedule of formation and development. And if you know that, if you've known that, if you know that from studying skeletons of these animals, you can look at a skeleton and say, ah, this is from an animal of about such and such an age. And in this case, that age is somewhere in the mid 30s. When the bones are removed from the site, our first job will be to clean them off. They clearly have clay on them, a lot of sediment, so they need to be very carefully cleaned. If we have time, we'll do some of that work here while we're at the Fowler Center. If not, we'll have to do some of that work in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan where we're taking the bones for detailed study. Our overall plan is to analyze them and process, extract, interpret the evidence that we gather from these bones and see whether it does in the end support the idea of human activity here involved with this animal. Uh, if it does, these bones will become part of the permanent archaeological record that we retain in our museum. Um, we are mostly paleontologists, but a paleontologist such as myself who works in times when humans were around also has to operate as something of an archaeologist. So. Um, uh, we will retain the material as the, uh, the evidence. Think of it as the evidence locker on your crime show where uh, the evidence is kept for other scientists to evaluate on their own if they have any reason to, to doubt our conclusions.